the doctor and he, he described the symptoms and the doctor told him what to go and do. So the doctor was, was sent him on his way and then continued with his, 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 his people who were coming to see him, his appointments. And then the next day, he, he went into the park for a wee walk during lunchtime. And he saw this 92-year-old man walking through the park. And on his arm was this stunning 25-year-old blonde. And the doctor looked at him and he said, what are you doing? I'm doing what you told me. What? What? He said, you said, get a hot mama and go and enjoy yourself. And the doctor said, no. I said, you have a heart murmur. Take care of yourself. <laughs> we have selective hearing. You and I, we have selective hearing. We hear what we want to hear a lot of the time. But God is speaking. God is speaking to you, to me, all the time. Every time we breathe in and breathe out, God is giving us the gift of life. Every time we take a breath, God is saying that you are loved, that you're walking on this earth, that no matter what you face, I am with you. But too often we don't hear it. Too often we, we, we go our own way, we're, we're, we're kind of just filled up with our own stuff, and we don't hear the whisper of God speaking. Jesus gave us the model of how to pray. The disciples had been looking at Jesus and, and seeing how he prayed, and they wanted to learn. They said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And he gave us the model. And in that model, which we're going to go through a little bit this morning, in that model, we discover afresh and anew how much we are loved, how much we are loved and cared for, but also how it drives us to make a difference in the world. For those of you who are here for the dedication today, we've been going through a, a little series on, on all about our front lines, about how what we face day by day is as important as what we do on a Sunday. That here we gather on a Sunday together to be equipped to face all that we're going to face in the world during the week. So we have over on the corner, we've got a map. And, and if you're from far-flung places, we'd love to have you to put a wee dot, a wee drawing pin on where you might think you, you're from. If, if you're, it's only Edinburgh, the map. So if, you, if, you're, if you're from down south, if you're from east or west, maybe just put it on the sides of the map. But we would love to see that because it's encouraging for you and for me and for all of us to see that even though we sometimes think we're on our own as Christians, we're making a huge difference wherever we are. And that's what we want to think about this morning. So we turn to Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus teaches us about prayer. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. But if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Whoever we are, even in the times when we feel insignificant, we make a difference in this world because as believers in Jesus Christ, we are sons and daughters of the King. 
We are children of God, and we have value, we have worth, we have significance, because our life on the front line flows from this identity. This is liberating. Now, the Lord's Prayer can be so familiar that we just skate through it, don't we? We, we don't really pay attention to it. We, we, we pray it most Sundays in churches across the country, and we just do it. And we think not so much about what we're praying, and often we think even less about what it means for us as God's people caught up in what He's doing in the world. The wonder about this prayer is at the very beginning, it tells us who we are. It tells us who we are and whose we are. Our Father in heaven. As we pray, we're praying to be established in our identity as children of God. As we pray, our Father, now in, in Jesus' time, you maybe know this quite well, in Jesus' time, no one referred to God as Father. No one addressed him in such personal times. No one, no one said to him, Daddy, because this is, what, this is what Jesus uses. He uses the word Abba. Now, we had an Abba, Abba tribute night here a few weeks ago. That's not the Abba that we're talking about, which was a great night. But the, 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 the Abba that, that Jesus is talking about is a dad who, I've told this story many times before, I've been on, uh, we were in, in Israel and, and I heard a wee child who had just fallen, just want his dad and he shouted out, Abba, Abba, Abba. And that is how God wants us to address him, to know his love, to know that he deeply cares for us, to know that he holds us when we fall, when we call out, he lifts us up. Our Father in heaven. It's life-changing to know that first and foremost, we are sons and daughters of our heavenly Father, a Father who will never let us down, a Father who will never let us go, a Father who will never leave. Whoever we are, we are loved with all wisdom and all understanding. There will be times in life when this will be the only anchor in your life. It will also be the key that unlocks your prisons, to know that he loves you, that he is for you, and that truth brings our greatest joy, even in the midst of heartache. Now, boys, is there a PowerPoint for this? I've got some, I've got some headlines just to help people remind us. So, when we pray our Father in heaven, we're praying to be established in our identity as the children of God. But also, as we continue on, as we say, hallowed be your name, we're praying for our part in the Father's business. Because as Christians, we're not meant to rest on our laurels. We are meant to be about the Father's business. We're meant to be stepping out and acting for God, not only in our lives and the lives of others, but the things that break our hearts, the thing that breaks God's heart. So when we begin to pray this prayer, we're reminded that what has actually happened is that God, we didn't choose God, God has chosen us. And through Jesus, we are grafted into his purposes. Often we, often we pray, God, may you do this for me, when actually we should be saying, Lord, what is it you want to do? And can I get on board in this? We're called to align ourselves with his cause and his way of doing things to be part of the family business. It's global, it's redemptive, it's liberating, and it is included in our day-to-day -day lives. So, this time tomorrow, 11.41, tomorrow morning, where will you be? What will you be doing? How can you bring about God's purposes in your life this time tomorrow? It's always a good question to ask. This time tomorrow, where will I be? When we gather on a Sunday, it's, it's kind of easy. We're surrounded by others who are, are pretty much sharing the same things. And, and about the same things. But this time tomorrow, you may be in a desert place. You may be in a tough, tough place to be a Christian. And that is when 
I would say, is the most important time to pray this prayer. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we pray this part of the prayer, we're praying for regime change. I don't know if you've ever lost anything. Have you ever lost anything? Of course you have. We've probably, you've probably lost your keys about three times this morning already, and they're in your pocket. Have you ever gone into a room wondering what you're going to do in that room, looking for your glasses, and they're on top of your head? I, I, that's maybe just me. But everyone has lost something. And, and then there's a website, there's a mobile app as well, www.lostandfound.com. And this acts as a, a global lost and found. I, I remember um, my, my father was a police officer and, and we used to, you know, if, if we found a, a pound on the street, for example, and, and, and being good, good sons of a policeman, we would say, Dad, what do we do with this pound? Put it in my pocket. No, hand it in to the lost and found. And we would hand it in to the lost and found in, in Bucksburn Police Station in, in, in Grampian. And, and Dad, Dad you know, he, he, was, he was one of the officers in there. So we got to have a look in the lost and found place. And it was fascinating. So much junk in there. So much crap. But people had lost these things and, and obviously cared about them. And so this website, you, you can say, I've lost my phone or I've lost my, I've lost my cuddly toy, whatever it is. And then a global search goes out. I've never tried it, but I've just heard about it. And, and they say the, the, the hit rate is that twice as many people have lost things as are found. And we all hate to lose stuff, don't we? We, we? we hate to lose things that are dear to us. But when we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done, we're actually praying for change. And when we pray for change, that means things will no longer be as comfortable and as nice as they once were. The, the safety and the security and the comfort that we've got from our, it's like an old pair of slippers, isn't it? We, we, we love our old pair of slippers, they're comfy. However, everyone else in the house are going, see those slippers, they're stinking. Get rid of them. And then you have to break in a new pair and they're uncomfy and, and it's just not quite the same. But everyone else is blessed by your new slippers. And in the same way, as followers of Jesus, when we're called for his kingdom, for heaven to come to earth, we're praying for things to change. We're praying for regime change, that God's will would be done. And this kingdom clashes with the alternative ways of life. When Jesus first taught this prayer, the Roman Empire were in charge, and the Jewish people were oppressed. They were working out what it meant to be the people of God under these difficult conditions. And some believed that if they concentrated on, on becoming more holy, then they would survive. And others thought that they could accommodate the political powers and they would survive. Others just disappeared to the desert. And most ordinary people just tried to get on with things. Different world today. But when you look out there and you see all the stuff that's going on, you wonder, how can I be a Christian? How can I be a follower of Jesus in this world? And the truth is, we do it because he is with us and he is leading us. And even when the times seem so chaotic, he will lead us through. And so when Jesus came and declared that the kingdom of God had arrived, even though we will lose some things, we will never lose him. And also he will never lose you. He will never let you go. No matter what you're facing, he will not let you go. And so we join in the prayer for the regime change, for the kingdom of God to come, for the people to know him. But also we pray for today's needs. Give us today our daily bread. And as we pray for our daily bread, as we pray for our, our, our everyday needs, whatever they are, it shows an attitude of relying upon our Heavenly Father. It's a showing of our description and our relationship with Him that we need Him each and every day. 
and this can be a challenge for those of us who like to be in control. Just put your hand, just, just turn to the person next to you and say to them, I like being in charge, or actually I don't like being in charge. Just tell them what it is you like to do. Do you like to be in control? <laughs> it might be the person next to you going, I know. There are, there are folks saying, I, I know, I know you like to be in control. It's okay. <laughs> but you see, when, when you're praying this prayer, when you're praying, Lord, give me my daily bread, you're submitting to him. You're, you're letting go, and you're letting him take control. Daily, that can be a challenge for us. But perhaps the bigger challenge for us today is is praying for yesterday's mistakes, where we say, forgive us our debts. Lord, forgive us for the mistakes we've made. But also, as we forgive our debtors, for those who have sinned against us. Jesus, Jesus knew his disciples. Jesus knew that they would make mistakes. He'd seen it, and he knew that in the future there would be mistakes as well. And I think he he put this in here to remind us that each one of us, every day is a challenge, and that there are things that we need to deal with regularly, that we need to keep short accounts with our Father, that we would need to be forgiven, and we would also need to forgive. And so as we know that we are forgiven, how can we not forgive those who have sinned against us? Even when it's the hardest thing to do, how could we not forgive? There was a teacher who, for reasons of her own, said these words to the class. Now, class, if all the bad children were painted red and all the good children were painted green, which color would you be? And I know you're, you're thinking, what color would I be? Oh, I don't know. It's quite a tough question, isn't it, when there's only two options. Thankfully, one very wise child put their hand up and said, I would be striped. <laughs> and I think that's probably true of us all. We're not as good as we think we are. And people around us are not as good as we wish they were. Thankfully, Jesus breaks the cycle of failure with forgiveness between us and God and between each other. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. We're praying for tomorrow, for tomorrow's walk and tomorrow's work. Jesus seems to think that we shouldn't be too confident about our abilities as his disciples. There is an enemy that wants to seduce us away from the ways of the kingdom. And so times of testing will come, and here we are called to pray for protection and deliverance. We don't go onto our front lines. We don't go onto our front lines on our own. But we go, remember, if you were here last week, as ambassadors of Christ, meaning that we go in his power. We go in his protection. We go in his presence. No matter what we face tomorrow, we do not go alone. Serving God on our front lines is not about trying harder. It's about learning to allow the resurrection power of God to work in and through us as we embrace the things that God has asked us to do. But it begins with a clear sense of our identity. We've got a a short film clip just to help us reflect on what we've been talking about. So we're going to see that now. We can be confident that we can make a difference. Not only because of what we do, but because of who we are and what God is doing in us as well as through us. We can be secure in our identity and therefore confident on our Monday mornings. There's a wonderful story 
of Maya Angelou, who wrote the book, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. And she tells a story. She was an active member of the church in San Francisco before she died. But she wrote that when she first came to San Francisco as a young woman, she decided she had to become sophisticated. She said that you were supposed to do that when you went to San Francisco. And for that reason, she became agnostic. She thought that the two went together. She said that it wasn't that she stopped believing in God. It was just that God no longer frequented the neighborhoods that she visited. And at the time, she took vocal lessons, voice lessons. And her teacher in her lesson gave her an exercise where she was to read out from a religious pamphlet. The reading ended with these words, God loves me. And she read it. But then the vocal coach said, read it again. And then she read it again, but this time she read it a bit more sarcastically, God loves me. But then the vocal coach said, read it again. And then she began to read it and read it again. And after the seventh repetition of God loves me, something kind of clicked inside her, and she felt the tears flow and she remembered that God loves her. She began to see the truth in the statement that there was a real possibility that God loves me, she said. Maya Angelou, I suddenly began to cry at the grandness of it all. I knew if God loved me, I could do wonderful things. I could do great things. I could learn anything. I could achieve anything. For what could stand against me? with God on my side. What can stand against you with God on your side? Take joy in your identity as sons and daughters of the King, of your heavenly Father, of your Abba, and explore how who you are connects to where you are and what you do day by day. The wonder of the Lord's Prayer is that it starts with an assurance of our identity. And that makes all the difference in the world. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as also we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Amen.